controversies and scandals about intercollegiate athletics are absolutely daily fair. Last week, it was a stealthy trip by the president of Auburn University and two trustees to lure the football coach at the University of Louisville, unbeknownst to the incumbent coach at Auburn. The week before, there was a celebrated battle among the ousted athletic director, boosters, and the president of the University of Georgia. In fact, if you want to think back, it seems like it was a year ago, but it wasn't, that the whole Maurice Claret episode erupted at Ohio State University. And none of these headlines touch stories about lax admission standards, special treatment for admitted athletes, criminal activity by athletes, control over venues, times, and uniforms by Nike, Reebok, and the TV networks, the battle over BCS and bowl games, million dollar salaries for coaches, and lackluster graduation rates. It would be hard to reach a conclusion other than that intercollegiate athletics is in a bad mess and it's getting worse. Uh, but you say that's only true of big time programs. The student athlete model still reigns supreme at highly selective colleges and universities. Here, athletic prowess takes a distinct backseat to the academic abilities of students. Not so fast. In the Ivy League, recruited athletes are four times as likely to be admitted as comparable applicants not on the coach's recruit list. At elite colleges, recruited male athletes in football, basketball, and hockey had SAT scores between 119 and 165 points less than non-athlete peers. Three quarters of recruited male athletes in major sports and two thirds of male athletes in minor sports are in the bottom third of their college class in the Ivy League and selective colleges. In other words, athletic performance regularly trumps academic performance, even at institutions that allege to be faithful to the student athlete model. We are indebted, enormously indebted, to William Bowen, former president of Princeton University, and to Sarah Levin, a Harvard undergraduate, an all-American swimmer, and now a doctoral candidate in public health here at Harvard, for gathering these data, for drawing public attention to the adverse effects that athletics can have on academic quality and educational values, even at the most highly selective institutions. Bowen and Levin have published their results in the highly acclaimed book, Reclaiming the Game. Ms. Levin will talk for about 20 minutes about their findings, and then Dr. William Adams, with a colorful nickname Bro, who's the president of Colby College, the former president of Bucknell University, and an athlete in his own day, and I would guess I'd say in his own era, since we're roughly contemporaries, as an undergraduate at Colorado College, will offer his commentary for about 15 minutes. From both speakers, we'll learn the facts, the challenges, and the potential reforms. And then we will take questions from the audience with questions underscored. Uh, as much as you might like to deliver a speech of equal length to our speakers, I would encourage you to ask questions briefly, succinctly, without any uh, perorations that allow conversation. And let me just offer one final word of introduction because it's probably not entirely clear to you why I have been asked to serve as the moderator for this session. But it turns out that I am actually the only person at Harvard who can be entirely impartial because I am the only Harvard professor who would not have been admitted as an undergraduate to any of these highly competitive institutions based either on my academic ability or my athletic ability. This is what defines a disinterested party. <laughs> Ms. Levin. The Reclaiming the Game is essentially an empirically driven study, so I'm going to just take a little while to summarize sort of the key findings uh, and then leave it to the discussion and to Bro's talk, sort of what do we make of all this and um, what does it mean for policy? Uh, so we collected data from 33 schools um, and they're listed here. And essentially it was all eight of the Ivy universities, all 11 of the NESCAC colleges, uh, four universities from the University Athletic Association, 
a bunch of other liberal arts colleges which plan a variety of conferences around the country and three women's colleges. <coughs> and what we were able to do in this data that we collected that we weren't able to do in the previous book, The Game of Life, is to identify recruited athletes. And um, what we mean by recruited athletes is athletes who are identified by a coach in the admissions process, so who were listed by a coach as a desired candidate. Um, and so you might think, well, okay, how many athletes or recruited athletes in this sense are there? And the answer is that there's actually quite a lot, and this is the percent of the student body that's recruited athletes uh, at these schools. And the green bars are for the men, and the blue are for the women. And then going across, we have the Ivies, the UAA universities, the NESCAC colleges, and the other liberal arts colleges. Um, and you can see there's obviously a lot of variation between the schools. The Ivies, roughly a sixth of the men are recruited athletes, roughly a tenth of the women. Now, if you were to take all athletes, not just recruited athletes, these numbers would be much higher. Uh, and you can see, again, they're higher at the colleges, which are much smaller. And again, the numbers for athletes, not recruited athletes, would be much higher. So at the colleges, as many as half of the men and slightly under half of the women may play varsity athletics. Um, so then the next question you would say is, okay, so what does this mean if you're listed by a coach in admissions? What does that do for you? And here we have the admission rates um, for in blue applicants and in red recruited athlete applicants. Um, and I think the squares are for the men and the triangles are for the women, but the lines are very close, so it probably doesn't matter that much. Uh, and as you can see, your chances of getting into the IVs go up as your SAT scores go up. And we have across the bottom SAT scores ranging from below 1,000 to over uh, 1,500. But that at every level, there's a substantial advantage to being listed by a coach, to being a recruited athlete. Uh, and to give a sense of this, if your board scores are in the 1,200s and you're applying to the Ivies, you have about a 10% chance of being admitted. If you're listed by a coach, same SAT scores, same applicant, you now have a 5 in 10 chance of getting in. It's about five times as high. So it's really significant. Uh, and really what that is, is that's a measure of how much do the admissions officers listen to the coaches when they make their decisions? And so then the next logical question would be, so who do the coaches pick? Sort of how do those students differ from students that the admissions office might have chosen? So one relevant question is, how do they do academically? Uh, to begin with, I want to be quite clear, they graduate. They graduated at very high rates. They graduated at higher rates than everyone else. Everyone graduates from the Ivies, basically. Graduation rates are well over 90%. Uh, and that's not even taking into account people who might have transferred as opposed to just dropping out. So graduation at these schools isn't really a relevant bar the way it is some of the big Division 1A programs where very few of the basketball players are graduating, for example. But so you can look and see, so how do they do on sort of criteria? And this is the average SAT scores. And now we have three groups because we have in blue the students at large, which is just sort of what we call students who didn't participate in intercollegiate athletics, although they might have played intramurals or club sports. Um, and in red, we have the walk-on athletes, uh, which is all the athletes who weren't listed by the coaches in the admissions process. So walk-on tends to conjure up sort of an image of a novice, like somebody who's never played the sport before. And that's not really quite accurate for these schools. Many of the walk-ons are very talented high school athletes, very accomplished high school athletes. They may well have been in contact with the coach when they were applying. They just weren't listed in the admissions process. And in yellow, we have the recruited athletes, which again, we mean listed in the admissions process. And uh, in the, on the left, we have the high profile sports, and that's football and men's basketball and men's ice hockey. Uh, and then the lower profile sports, which are all other men's sports, and then the women's sports on the right. And if you can see, the biggest gaps are in the high-profile sports, where recruited athletes have SAT scores about 150, 160 points below students at large. But there's quite substantial gaps in the recruited athletes in the lower-profile and women's sports. And that's really, in some ways, a direct consequence of the nature of the admissions pools and the admissions advantage given. So really, a more relevant question might be sort of, what kind of grades do these students get? And here we have the percentile ranking class for the same groups. It's the same layout in the graph. We can see that recruited high-profile 
male athletes, which is football players, men's basketball, men's ice hockey, end up in about the 19th percentile of the class on average. So when you look at an average, you think, well, maybe a few people are dragging that number way down, a few very poor performers. So we also like to look at what percent of the group is in the bottom third of the class. Oh, too far. And we see that here. And we see that uh, in the high-profile sports, roughly 80% of the high profile recruited athletes are in the bottom third of the class. And in the lower profile male sports and in the women's sports, uh, there's also disproportionate representation in the bottom third of the class. They're not nearly as pronounced. And so this seems, okay, so lower SAT scores, lower grades, that seems pretty straightforward. What's really troubling to us is that actually the recruited athletes tend to do even more poorly than you would predict on the basis of their SAT scores and their choice of major, their demographics, sort of other characteristics. Um, we term this underperformance, and basically this is a measure of sort of how many percentile points below where you would predict do athletes end up. Uh, and so recruited athletes in the high profile sports end up about 19 percentile points below where you'd predict. So if you would predict a given male student, you know, on the basis of his race and his high school grades and SAT scores and what he majored in, uh, end up in about the 50th percentile, the middle of the class. But that same student is a recruited high-profile athlete, more likely to end up in about the 30th percentile, 31st percentile of the class. Uh, and you see that the you see underperformance as well for the lower profile sports and for the women's sports around sort of 10 to 15 points. Um, what's really interesting about this is it seems to be largely a phenomenon of the recruited athletes. So you see underperformance in the non-recruited athletes and the walk-ons, but it's not nearly as pronounced. And what's even more surprising to us is that the recruited athletes underperform even when they're not participating in athletics. So during the off-season, uh, in years they don't play on the team. You see not quite as much underperformance, but very close to the same amount. So this says to us that it really seems to have something to do with the recruitment and admissions process, and not so much with the demands of playing a sport in college. So just to sort of sum up, we see that recruited athletes get the substantial admissions advantage. They enter college with weaker credentials. Uh, and they go on to do sort of even less well than those credentials would predict. Um, so I'd say that these findings basically tell us something about the cost of the athletics programs as they're currently run at the Ivies. And though I only presented Ivy data because we're at Harvard, the findings for the New England Small College Athletic Conference are very similar. Uh, and really the only conference where we didn't see these sort of trends is at the University Athletic Association, uh, which is a Division Three association. But uh, it tells us something about the cost. It doesn't tell us anything about the benefits, uh, which are clearly substantial. And I guess what it tells us about the cost is something about how we ration opportunities. And I think there's sort of a few scarce resources being rationed here. One is spots at these schools, so places in the class, sort of who gets in. Another is spots on the team, who gets to play. Um, and a third is sort of what do we do with the time of students while they're on the campuses? So how do athletes spend their time while they're uh, on campus? And how do other students spend their time while they're on campus? Uh, and I think that that's really what we say about costs. And then I think really the challenge is can we reduce some of the costs we're observing without losing the benefits? And that's really what we are trying to say when we talk about reclaiming the game. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Dick. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to come and share a couple of thoughts about this important uh, book. Let me. Uh, say a couple of things about the perspective I bring to this and my interest in the topic and then move on to uh, the impossible task of saying what it all means. I'm not sure what it all means, but I have some thoughts about some of the things it might mean and I'm eager to hear 
a little bit more about the thoughts of people in the audience about what they think it uh, might mean. Let me, before I go into that, offer a little bit of perspective on how I come to this issue and what my interest uh, is in it. I'm the president of Colby. Uh, as Dick said, I was president of Bucknell for uh, almost six years, a Division I institution, a Division I context, but one with a very powerful athletic tradition and, um, and also one with a powerful athletic tradition and history. And in its own way, Colby and the other next SCAC schools have equal, equally powerful traditions and histories. So I've been president of two institutions with very powerful uh, athletic uh, commitments. My perspective is not only institutional, but also personal. I was a student athlete, as Dick mentioned, uh, in college. Uh, I had two college careers, so the first was different from the second, but during the first, I participated in three uh, sports, uh, soccer, skiing, and lacrosse. Those were the days when the NCAA didn't permit first-year students to be members of the varsity team, but the commitments were full and uh, very powerful me, for me personally. Uh, and that personal experience in a collegiate context, not very different from Colby. I was a uh, a student, an undergraduate student at Colorado College in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, that experience was shaping for me in some pretty powerful ways. Uh, it gave me a lifelong interest in athletics. Um, it gave me, I think, a lot of resources uh, and learning experiences for which I'm very grateful. And it was the beginning of a road to understanding, I think, in a pretty deep personal way the educational ideal that's been attached to athletics in certainly the New England Small College Athletic Conference context, schools like Colby, um, who have had long-standing commitments, but I also suspect the athletic ideal at the Ivy League institutions, as far as I understand that ideal, and at many other places across the country. And as I think all of you know, that athletic ideal and its place in the educational uh, context and setting and the belief that there is a very powerful educational opportunity in intercollegiate athletics is unique to higher education in the United States. There is nowhere in the world that produces uh, an experience quite like this. It's something that we have been committed to for a long time in this country and it's very deeply a part of places like Colby, Colorado College, the Ivy institutions. Not as an entertainment issue and not as a, uh, a, a sideline to the educational program. But we have told ourselves for a very long time, and I think with very substantial reason, that it's a central part of the educational program for those students involved. And that is the reason it places like Colby, and I dare say initially for a long time in the Ivy League, that is the reason why we have been committed uh, to these programs and remain committed to them with such extraordinary levels of resources and interest and energy uh, at places like Colby where you won't be surprised to hear it's the participation of athletes, not the spectator value of athletics that justifies our commitment and really provides the central core of conviction and belief in the athletic program. I say that by way of perspective because I think it's very important as we're thinking about the implications of this very interesting work that Sarah and Bill have done, that we stay focused on at least what I regard to be the point, and that is in the spirit of the title, reclaiming the game, recovering a kind of traditional sense of the athletic ideal at our institutions, and being able to be sure of that ideal and the educational values that we attach to it as we move into the future, which provides me with the second part of what I wanted to say, which is the context for this and some guesses about what it all means. The national context, and I think what the book uh, demonstrates in a very powerful way, has to do with the fact that over the last three decades at least, a couple of things have been happening in intercollegiate athletics and indeed across American society, and I really should begin with that because I think there is a clear chain of causation there, though it is informatively, I think, a loop of a certain kind. 
We have seen in this country the growing competitiveness and what I would call professionalization of athletics for at least the last three decades. It's observable in every part of the country. It's observable in every institution that is concerned with athletics. Uh, it has to do with many commercial forces in the society and in the culture. But it has come down to, I think, the same thing fundamentally in all the places we observe it, and that is that there is more and more competitive pressure placed upon individuals and programs of all kinds and more commercial pressure placed on those individuals, both with respect to participants and, I think, the professionals who coach, who teach in our settings. With respect to competitive success and re with respect to the specialization of athletic skill and uh, the qualities of individuals both on the teaching side and on the participation side, the athletes themselves. As Dick said, we thought for a long time that the effects of specialization and professionalization were principally appearing in Division I. Uh, we all know what those uh, conditions are. We read about them all the time, as Dick said. I want to say pretty clearly at the outset, I think this book is not about that issue. I think it's about a fundamentally different issue. And it's about, I think, for the first time revealed in a very clear way, how those pressures have insinuated themselves into settings where we are surprised to see their effects, namely very highly selective liberal arts colleges and private universities of the kind uh, that we observe in the Ivy League and other places like them across the country, not with respect to the scandalous things that happen, because that isn't going on, typically in my experience, in any way at all, but with respect specifically to the experience of student athletes and particularly as Sarah has pointed out effects through recruiting on the admission process and the pressure that those programs place on that process on the one hand and secondly even more importantly from my point of view the performance of student athletes in the classroom with respect to the expectations that we should have for them and do have for them given their credentials as they come to us. The latter is, I think, the most worrisome thing. And I will assure you that the data that has been presented in this book um, is data that were provided by the Ivy League and by NESCAC and the other conferences. And we have tested that data internally and locally in ways that convince us that it is, as reported in the book, worrisome. Partly on the score of recruiting, but most fundamentally for me with respect to the so-called phenomenon of underperformance, which Sarah demonstrated briefly in some of these graphs, which talk about the ways in which some recruited athletes are underperforming the expectations that we would have for them based upon their credentials at the time of admission. I want to say pretty quickly, because it's a pretty important point, that this is not an issue about individuals and their efforts, energy, commitment, so much as it is, I think, principally an issue about institutional practices, whether we consider that in the local context of a place like Colby or Williams or Amherst or Harvard, and also more regionally and nationally with respect to the way our institutions relate to one another and the general context in which we work and play, in this case, these games. What has happened both locally, I think, and nationally, and going back to the meaning of it all, is that these competitive and professional and commercial pressures have now begun to show up in our institutions in troubling ways. And I think the language of the book is very helpful here in describing this finally as a kind of divide, a divide between the academic and educational mission of the institution and an increasingly worrisome preoccupation with competitive success that drives the admission process, that drives resources, and that has over time a very serious ratcheting impact upon all of our institutions. Now, there's been lots of other ratcheting in higher education, and Dick, among others, have, have written about this. And we see it in every aspect of institutional life. But we see it with particular clarity, I think, in the athletic side of our lives. And I think what we really need to pay attention to here are the trends 
that these national pressures imply or embody and the effects they imply over a much longer period of time. Imagine, think, consider where our programs have come in the last 30 years. The specialization of skills, the specialization of coaching, the ratcheting effect that's gone on financially in our institutions with respect to the financial commitment to the programs and what it takes to field a team now in, you pick the sport, uh, whatever it is, relative to where we were 20 years ago. And the extrapolation of those trends over time is terribly worrisome, I think. And it's worrisome not because, going back to some things Sarah has said, uh, we, we've seen the, the evaporation of the benefits of these programs in many ways. Those benefits are still in place in many ways. But I think over a longer period of time, they may be threatened. And what particularly might be threatened is this traditional ideal of the scholar-athlete engaged in a wide array of activities, the balance of the athletic ideal as a sort of a, a notion of balance in the overall college experience. And it's the threat to that particular construction of the athletic ideal and its educational values that I think is really at issue in this book and in the work that has been done. What is to be done about all of this? Uh, I would say that I think three things. Uh, first, we have to find some way nationally of modifying the effects of recruiting on the process of admission. I think that is not so much a local issue as it is a conference and national issue. I'm not sure what the answers are. Uh, the NCAA has started to become interested in this and related issues. Uh, there is a group of colleges across the country uh, that are getting very interested in it. But it has to be a group and collective effort. It can't be an isolated effort because it is, after all, a competitive universe in which we're existing. The second, I think, thing that we need to think about as institutions has to do with this issue of underperformance and how we make sure that athletes succeed in all of the ways that all students are expected to succeed. And we don't have different, fundamentally different expectations and outcomes for athletes or any other group of students. And by the way, there are other issues with other groups of students that one could talk about that also concern us with respect to underperformance, but there should be no group underperforming in our institutional settings. And finally, I think we have to find ways of closing the cultural divide, uh, whether it's at Harvard or Colby or uh, Amherst or wherever, this notion that there are kind of separating cultures of students, of professionals, with fundamentally different interests, fundamentally different attributes, is in the setting of institutions like ours very worrisome. And I think we need to find ways of closing that divide. We could talk a little bit about some of the ways that we've explored uh, at Colby to do that. But that's a little bit of perspective on what this work means and some of the issues that we're facing, I think, as institutions and as a society and culture with respect to these very profound and significant trends that exist over time. All, once again, in the context of, I think, a quite profound and appropriate commitment to the educational values of athletic programs, which has been su such a signal uh, and singular part of institutional history at the Ivy League institutions and in the New England Small College Athletic Conference. I will stop. I invite, with a group of this um, size and closeness, I think we can have some good conversation and discussion about this. So um, let me stop, and, and Sarah and I will will take questions and we, engage. We only ask that you um, wait until you have the microphone, just so that your questions can be recorded for people who view it later via video. So you can flag down Shannon or I. Both have mics. Yes. I'd really like you asking you to speculate in some way because the, the deep thing you're talking about is some societal thing uh, that seeps in. Now, high schools, which is one of my interests, would you say that, again, there's a correlation or that in some way that comes into it in the same way that, well, competition about SATs is certainly much more intense now than when I applied to an Ivy League school. And so... Do you think, I mean, that it's, it's at that level that it's coming in that deeply, the professionalization of high school sports, and it's probably even 
badminton. We're not just talking about football, mm -hmm. right? And so I would like to you to step yeah. in on what you see happening. I'll yeah. ask Sarah to start. Uh, I think that's that's huge. And what we hear from coaches, and we went out and talked to a lot of coaches as well as other people on campuses, over and over was this comes from the high school, and we heard it also from the athletic directors. We the people. Students are specializing in athletics so young, and it's even before high school. I mean, already in the youth sports programs are so intense that by the time they get to college, they want to play their sport year-round. They've been playing their sport year-round since they were 10 years old. They want to be able to weight train in the off-season. They would... They don't want a coach who coaches a different sport in the, in the spring and not their sport because they want the attention. They want to continue building their skills. And so I think absolutely that there's pressures coming up from the students through the high school and the youth uh, sports programs. I think that there's also important signaling that goes back the other way, which is that we know that high school students are very concerned with getting into college and are very concerned with getting into schools like the NESCAC schools or the Ivies. And that it sends an extremely powerful message. People know that being a recruited athlete is a huge advantage. In fact, we're seeing now uh, in newsletters going out to high school athletes, you know, Sarah Levin and, and William Bowen have, you know, shown that being a recruited athlete is a huge advantage. We were right. You're doing the right thing by telling your kid to spend all their time playing their sport. Uh, it, it is what's going to get them into college. Uh, and so I think that there's also very important signaling going back the other way, and that if this weren't such an important way of getting your student or your child into these schools, that maybe you wouldn't see quite as much focus uh, in the high schools. Yeah, Sarah's absolutely right. I agree with all of that. Uh, some of you saw the New York Times piece, uh, was it last week, about youth sports? And it was actually about a rebellion of some parents. It was an interesting piece, I think, in Cincinnati or... Uh, somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, there is a signaling effect that goes on here that's very powerful, uh, but you're absolutely right. These effects are being seen in high schools, uh, in, and it's Sarah's right. That the students we that I talk to about this like the specialization. This isn't an easy audience. Not, I mean, you. I mean, uh, the, the, the student athletes at Colby with whom I talk about this a lot, the interest in specialization and the intensity factor is very high. Um, and we don't create that. We, we live with it. But we are giving very strong signals to admission counselors, to parents, about, about recruiting. And um, the signals, I talk to admission counselors all the time, and the signals are unequivocal. So there is a, a loop of impact, but the professionalization that I talk about is happening everywhere. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I obviously haven't read the book yet, but I will pick it up. Um, I was wondering what the correlation is between um, student athlete poor performance academically and winning and losing uh, in the schools as that relates to who gets in. And so are, are schools with losing teams the ones that are lowering, their, lowering standards to let kids in? Or is it, conversely, the schools that are, that are winning, are they the ones that are <laughs> lowering the standards? So I don't know what you found. Um, that's actually a fascinating question that we didn't really look at very directly, uh, but we should. Uh, but I guess what I would say is the... Trends we observed were very consistent across schools. So at least in the school level, in sort of, there weren't big differences uh, within a conference, for example, between schools. So to the extent which some schools are sort of predominant athletic powerhouses and some are sort of constant doormats, there doesn't seem to be differences in that. Now, whether it relates sort of directly to a given team's record that year, I don't know, but it would be worth looking at. Or maybe to the year before, I mean, who you're taking in after a good year or a bad year. I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting questions there that we didn't really examine. I, I can't comment on the data because um, I didn't gather it or, or interpret it. But, and it is an interesting question. But I, I want to emphasize that it's, it's easy to paint this with too broad a brush in the sense of this is not all recruited athletes, uh, and it's not all athletes. There are some important variations in the data, in the Colby data, and also in the in the data in the book. 
with respect to sports and individuals. So there's some more understanding to be done here with respect to some of these effects. I just wanted to be clear, this is not a, this is not a universal description of all student athletes or even all recruited athletes. It's the observation of certain worrisome trends in some parts of that population. I think that, right. is that that's a I fair. Think, and I think just as a statistical point, um, which I think is always worth mentioning, that we're making statements about population averages. Uh, and, you know, the population of relevance might be all athletes, it might be recruited athletes, it might be the soccer team. Uh, but that if you want to make statements about an individual, you can do that with much less confidence. So well, when we can say that athletes on average, recruited athletes in high profile sports, on average underperform by 20 percentile points, and we know with 90 percent certainty it's between, you know, 22 percentile points and 18 percentile points. If we wanted to say what would we predict a given student athlete to do, we would, the confidence interval would be much wider. We would, there's a mu much more variation when you're talking about an individual level. So I think just to reemphasize, this really is about the policies that lead to the averages we're seeing, and certainly not a statement about any individual person. Hi. Um, one question is that they instituted the academic index around in the mid '90s, I think, and and they thought they had at that point. Well, we're gonna we're gonna raise the threshold for admitting people, and they found out it wasn't that simple. Um, other than doing that again and just making the bar higher, how else can you deal with these findings while students are on campus? What what kind of like concrete solution mm -hmm. can you come up with? or have maybe you thought of um, right. to, to deal with them. You mentioned some of them in your, your statement, but. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, just to give a little history on the academic index, my co-author was actually very involved in developing the academic index. He was uh, the president of Princeton at the time it was implemented. Uh, and they really did think, you know, okay, we've got the problem. There's lower SAT scores, set a bar. You can't have lower SAT scores or can't have beyond a certain deviation in SAT scores. And that's, I think, part of why he in particular was very troubled when we uncovered this underperformance phenomenon because it says, oh, wait, there's more to the story. How do people do? And I guess what I think the data most directly speak to in terms of policy, if you want to address these costs, is it's about how much weight do you give the coaches' lists. And then I think really what we're picking up in underperformance is, okay, we can measure the break that athletes are given on SAT scores or even probably on high school grades because those are easily measured and easily observed by us. Everyone has an SAT score or an ACT score, and it, the schools give it to us. Uh, what we don't pick up at all is the um, all the other academic criteria that go into admissions decisions. So what the admissions office gets from teacher recommendations, what they get from the essays, sort of things about intellectual curiosity or academic drive or things like this. Um, and that really, I think, probably what we're picking up in underperformance is the break that af recruited athletes are getting on that, which it seems plausible they are given the break they're given on sort of what we observe on the SAT scores. And further evidence for that would be that when we look at uh, individual schools, a few schools were able to give us their sort of academic reader ranking. So especially at the colleges, uh, faculty will read the admissions profile, I mean, they'll read the application and they'll give an academic ranking, which takes into account, obviously, all those things, how difficult the high school courses were, things like this. Uh, and that when we use that, we see much less underperformance, but we see a larger admissions advantage. So I think that's sort of part of what we're picking up in underperformance. So that really speaks to sort of needing to have, if you want to address underperformance, less weight given to the coach's decisions, the coach's preferences in admissions, but how you implement that and enforce that on a conference level is not nearly as clear because, again, it's much harder to measure. It's not as simple as just setting an academic index. Um, I think there's also probably important things that can happen on campus in terms of culture, but I think you probably would know much more about that. No, I don't know if I know much more. I have some thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> apart from the admission issue, there's a performance outcomes issue, and Bill Bowen has been particularly um, insistent on this. I, I disagree with him a little bit about the, all of the problems with the index, but uh, 
I do agree that outcomes assessment is a hugely important issue for us. In other words, how do people actually do? <laughs> and how do you monitor performance? How do you internalize performance in coaches' evaluations and the expectations that coaches uh, have with and for their athletes? the way in which coaches are involved in discussions of academic priorities and the academic program, all of the policies which control and limit uh, the intensity factor, I think, are also in play. And I think there are cultural issues about making sure that coaches feel central to the academic mission and making sure that faculty, frankly, understand the educational value of athletics and aren't, aren't doing the the push away. So I think there are a lot of cultural issues on our campuses about reintegrating athletics into the sort of the educational sense of things. I think there are performance questions with respect to coaches. There are information issues. We need to provide information to coaches about how students are doing in much more refined and full ways than we have in the past. Um, there are a lot of both cultural and I think uh, outcomes assessment related steps that we need to take and those are being talked about very aggressively on campuses they're also being talked about frankly at the conference level in NESCAC I don't know what the state of play with the uh, Ivy is in terms of conference activities or discussions but it's very lively in NESCAC um, on that issue uh, I remember about a year ago there was a movement afoot I think it was at least among the Ivies and maybe some division ones that athletes take seven weeks off and I wanted to know, was that actually instituted and what was the outcome and effect of that on performance? That was instituted and it was just an IV rule uh, instituted about a year ago. And to give a sense of this, we've been giving preliminary data to the presidents of these schools for probably about two years was when we probably first presented it. And so that this has been an ongoing conversation between us and the schools and part of our analysis was driven by questions that came back from the schools uh, and part of the policies they've implemented are in part response to what we've already shown them. And um, the Ivy's implemented a few changes. They reduced the number of football recruits from 35 to 30 uh, and they put instituted the seven uh, week off period and they also I believe made some changes in who the academic index applies to to more broadly extend it across sports uh, and I think that the feeling is the seven week off period was not very successful that people were very unhappy with it that athletes and coaches were very unhappy with it um, but that I think that the idea behind it which was to give athletes a chance to participate in other ed extracurricular activities and other aspects of university life is admirable and I think maybe there needs to be more work done on how to accomplish that goal without um, creating so much dissatisfaction. If, if I could just comment because this is a very important issue. Um, the, the New England Small College Athletic Conference has the most restrictive out-of-season practice regulations of any conference in the country. Basically, there is no out-of-season practice in NESCAC. Um, but I'll tell you that the institutional creep on this was significant. And it turns out that non-coaching uh, non staff but student-organized practice was becoming a very big deal. Uh, predictable, well-organized, and rather constant across a number of sports. And we had a kind of a bloody battle about this uh, in NESCAC. Um, the presidents reasserted the out-of-season practice rule. Uh, we pushed on, on it pretty hard locally. And it was not a, a popular thing to do. It was, it was as, as Sarah implies, it was deeply worrisome and upsetting to students. I think it is stuck in NESCAC. Um, but it's a good example of the way in which these trends evolve and the expectation that you would now spend most of your out-of-season time doing your sport is very typical now in Division I. Uh, it's becoming typical in Division III. Uh, there's some movement afoot with the NCAA to talk about reforms in this regard. It is hugely resisted by most of the membership of Division III. It's a, very, it's a very good example of the ratcheting that's gone on over the last 10 to 15 years and the way in which expectations have changed. Okay, hi. Um, I haven't read the book yet, but I was wondering if you and Bowen looked at 
the overlap of students who traditionally are underperforming and then those who are also athletes. Like, you know, I'm thinking about students recruited for perhaps football, basketball, the big kind of sports, and what did you guys find um, with that group? Was there a big overlap in that group? Or, Between I'm, athletes and, and other groups? Of right, other groups that traditionally underperform. underperforming. Um, so I guess the most relevant group here and that people are often very interested in is how does this relate to race? Um, and there's a, ver there's a variety of questions that people really have about that. One is sort of how does the admissions advantage athletes get compared to the admissions advantage given in affirmative action programs to minority students, to underrepresented minority students? And the answer to that question, just to quickly give that context, is that the advantage given to athletes with the Ivies is much larger than the advantage given to underrepresented minorities. And at the colleges, the two advantages are roughly comparable because the athletes get a smaller advantage and the minorities get a larger advantage. Um, another question is, what does athletic recruitment do for diversity on campus? Um, and the answer is that athletic recruitment does not contribute to racial diversity in the sense that recruited athletes are actually less likely to be minorities uh, than other students. It seems surprising at first until you think about how many teams these schools field. The Ivies field on average about 30 to 40 sports. And many of those sports are sports that are played traditionally by very affluent groups um, and you know, squash, sailing, things like this. Uh, and um, then sort of the question is how does this relate really to to underperform it. So first of all, just to be clear, because athletes are not more likely to be minorities, it can't just be that they're minorities and that's what's going on in underperformance. And actually we controlled for racial differences. Um, and it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be sort of interesting interactions in the sense that minority students who are athletes don't seem to do better or worse than other minorities, you know, they don't seem to do better or worse than you would expect as sort of the combination of the two effects of uh, minority underperformance and athletic underperformance. Um, although uh, there are some, en when you sort of enter in socioeconomic status, it gets a little more complicated. Again, there don't seem to be interesting interaction effects, but especially in the high profile sports, athletes are slightly more likely to be on financial aid. Um, although again, if we control for that, it doesn't take away uh, athletic underperformance. In fact, there doesn't even really seem to be in our data a very strong correlation of performance and socioeconomic status measured by whether or not you're on financial aid, and that may be too crude of a measure um, since you know, maybe 50 or 60 percent of the students are on financial aid. Um, so I hope that sort of gives a sense. Um, I guess another thing that tends to come up is sort of one of the current theories about minority underperformance is uh, based on Claude Steele's work on stereotype threat. And there's been sort of interest in maybe athletes are responding to a type of stereotype threat that there's hostility on the part of other students or on the part of professors towards athletes and that that's leading to underperformance. And we don't really have very good data to speak to that. Um, it seems slightly unlikely in the male athletes in that they have, tend to have very high academic self-confidence, um, which you think might be protective in so, to some extent. Uh, it seems maybe more plausible in the female athletes, but then you get into a question of sort of how readily identifiable is a female athlete to a professor um, compared to maybe a basketball player or a football player who might physically be very obviously an athlete. Lo local effects. It local study at Colby affirm all those things. The stigmatization issue is, is I, I'm, I'm a little more convinced, I think, than Sarah, that this might be a pretty serious issue. And it's interesting she mentioned Claude Steele's work because uh, his work is kind of pioneering in all of these stigmatization uh, issues, uh, including race, but not just race. And uh, but. The sort, the sort of the disconnects that, that Sarah describes are also, were also observable in our data. There doesn't seem to be a lot of correlation there. Um, but stigmatization issues and underperformance issues also apply to other groups in our populations in different ways. And those are in themselves worrisome and uh, the object of some intense scrutiny a lot of liberal arts colleges have come together in this consortium for higher achievement and success which is trying to deal with this with respect to 
underrepresented groups generally. Uh, Steele's work is very important there. And uh, so there are other groups one can worry about, and we do, and that's important to know. I'm curious, in talking about the admissions advantage and the idea that recruited athletes have a four times or five times higher chance of being admitted, is this just looking at the coaches list or is it looking at the larger pool of, of student athletes that coaches initially speak to? Because I have to imagine that coaches themselves are doing a pretty good job of screening out students because they're not a good academic fit or athletic fit or personal qualities fit. And so you've already got a much smaller group of students competing for spots than the larger group. I mean, if we could have people telling great violinists or mathematicians or other students you really shouldn't be applying because you're not going to be a fit. I think percentages might be a little different. I'm just wondering how that factors in. This is, this is interesting, and that's sort of uh, the first question most coaches ask about admissions advantage. And the extent of pre-screening, and there clearly is a huge amount, uh, you know, most coaches will tell us they start with 200, 400 names, then they slowly screen down on a variety of factors, um, but certainly including academic profile. Is that athletes are slightly less likely to be at the very bottom. If you look at the applicant pools, who applies, and you look at recruited athlete, and this is who's listed by the coach, and other applicants, athletes are slightly less likely to be sort of at the very bottom, say for the Ivies, below 1,100 board scores. Uh, but then sort of between 1,100, at sort of in 1,200s, 1,300s, the recruited athlete applicants are sort of much more likely to be in those groups and then it, when you get to 14, 1500s, they're much less likely to be. So there is pre-screening, but the distributions still look like athletes have lower SAT scores compared to other applicants, recruited athlete applicants, other applicants. Uh, so that actually, when you control for, uh, for SAT scores in this process, for example, you see there's a bigger advantage than just the absolute admission rates uh, for recruited athlete applicants and regular applicants. So pre-screening, certainly only, coaches are only presenting reasonable applicants in the sense that, you know, the Ivy's over 1,100, the colleges sort of maybe over 1,000 board scores. Um, but it's not in any sense giving a much stronger pool than the average applicant pool in terms of uh, academic credentials. Now, of course, that's not accounting for sort of what you're talking about, the fit, um, and the personality and sort of other things like that. And I guess that then the question is, really, what, what does the admissions advantage tell us? It tells us how much do the admissions office defer to the coach's decisions? Sort of how much do they look at what the coach wanted uh, and who the coach recommended? And I think then you have to look at outcomes to say, well, do we think the coaches are making similar decisions that the, than the decisions that we made by the admissions office? And there I would say the underperformance seems to be saying, no, they're making slightly different decisions. And from what we hear from coaches, it's really a question of focus. Uh, you know, we would ask coaches if uh, somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I want to come play you know, for your team, but, but I really, really want to come to Harvard because, like, the classics department is just so amazing, and I could study with Greg Nagy, and that is just the coolest thing ever, and, you know, there's this and that, and I just can't wait to get into Boston. I hear it's so fun, and there's all these arts, and the coaches would tell us, I wouldn't think twice about that person because a huge part of what the coach needs to do is make sure that they can continue fielding their team at the level they want to be fielding it. So they need to really look for people who are very committed to the sport and are very focused on the sport and are going to work very hard and are not going to quit the team. Uh, so they're looking for the same kind of sort of focus and drive that the admissions offices may be looking for in other aspects. Um, and that they may be less interested in sort of some of the, the focus and drive towards academics. Hi. Concur with. Uh, er, excuse me. Earlier, you were talking about uh, how you thought it was important for the faculty to understand the educational importance of athletics, opposed to, I guess, like publicity or something. Uh, for you, what is the educational value of uh, athletics? I, I don't think it's uh, 
mysterious. I think we, well, those of us who have been involved, and I think those, those of us who talk about this pretty generally agree, it's, it's, the, it's both the, um, I would say in a kind of an old-fashioned way, but a, a way I believe, a kind of character-building value. But I also, I also believe, and I don't think we've talked enough about this uh, with respect to the benefits of these programs, there, there, there are a set of intellectual, what I would call intellectual virtues and, and forms of um, excellence that I think also arise from athletic uh, engagement and competition. It has to do with you know, disciplines of mind. Uh, in, in some sports, the intellectual complexity of, of what's happening. Team sports have, I think, dimensions of that that are interesting and important. In addition to the, the, you know, the experience of, again, it, it sounds a little trite, but I think these things are true, the experiences of close uh, teamwork and, and reliance upon other people, the, the learning uh, about limits and transcending limits that goes on uh, in competitive uh, moments, in athletic competitive moments, uh, the transcendence of personal um, the experience of transcending personal limits uh, and, and um, barriers that one experiences, discipline, hard work, commitment over time, um, and of course all the physical attributes that those activities have. I think those values are pretty well understood. I, I don't think we're going to invent new forms of understanding that. I think we have to talk about them again in new ways, and I think the key to those things uh, within the broader context of academic life has to do with balance. Um, and the balance is supplied by the proportional nature of the activities. And what I think is at risk is this concept of proportionality and balance, not in the Title IX sense of proportionality, but in the sense of what is, what is, a, what is your life like as you go through the, the educational uh, program. Um, actually, I have two questions. Um, my first question, I think, is for Sarah. I was wondering if you, by any chance, looked at the spread. Um, when you're talking about the SAT scores, you said that the recruited athletes most likely to fall between the 1200 and 1300 range. I was wondering if you ever looked at maybe the coaches will only put those people on their list to recruit because the other students are more likely to get in on their own. And um, my other question was just kind of a follow-up on for Bro up at Colby. If I know after you implemented the restricted out-of-season practices, if you noticed a change at all in student performance. Um, I mean, just a personal mm -hmm. thing. I know when I was in my athletics, I was more focused to get things done because I had a tight schedule. So I was wondering if you had seen any effects of either of those. Thanks. Uh, in response to sort of to what extent do coaches leave someone off the list because they'll get in anyway, it's a really bad bet at Harvard. Uh, even if you have SAT scores above 1,500, you still only have about a 50% chance of getting in. Uh, so coaches told us they tended not to because they didn't trust that they would get the kid in anyway. Um, it seems possible to us that part of why recruited athletes are less likely to be minorities is that coaches do do it if they think there's another boost. So if it's, a co if it's a student who's a legacy or a minority and also has very high SAT scores, then that number goes up. So that may be part of why we see fewer recruited athletes who are minorities. Um, but I don't think it's, it's happening just purely on academic criteria. It's a very good question. And I would say um, quite candidly that the data at Colby don't suggest that there are fundamental difference between performance, uh, in performance between in season and out of season. That is to say, it it may verify your hypothesis that the activity brings uh, focus. Um, but my concern, and you you witnessed the the controversy. My concern was not simply about performance. And by the way, we haven't had time to, to measure this. This will take some significant, I don't know how long a statistician would tell us you need to wait. But it would take some time to sense any. Um... To me, it really was uh, more about 
this again going back to this concept of balance and the opportunities to engage other other things and whether that shows up in academic performance or not doesn't seem to me to, to end the conversation um, it, and it's another it's another way in which this escalation uh, has been occurring and I think making clear statements about the escalation is a good thing to do even if it's not built on academic performance uh, as an issue so you're right and in terms of the data at Colby it seems like there are no significant differences I don't recall what and if reclaiming the game dealt with that but we don't the intensity effects may come in in different ways but it doesn't seem to be the case at Colby that that it's coming in in that particular way but we haven't had time really to check this out and Colby is the same as other schools you don't see big differences in season and out of season which I think is to some extent a testament to the fact that what athletes tell you that in season you're more focused because you have a lot more time out of season so you might expect that performance would go up substantially out of season but actually it stays sort of about the same I think professionals experience by the way this in their own way in my own life I mean I I think I'm more productive when I'm busy so I understand the concept it's but I think there are other issues that present with respect to those occasions. We'll take two more questions if there. I see one here and then over there. So, I wanted to ask a question about I'm over here, about two things that were said that weren't directly coupled, but I find interesting to be said together. One of which was the reduction in the Ivy League of the number of recruited athletes, in particular in football. Um, and the comments you made earlier about coaches feeling pressure to make sure that they're selecting people who are focused on what, you know, what their sport that they're being recruited for. In your experience through the work that you've done, do you think rec reducing the number of recruited athletes is actually helping or hurting in this process? I think it depends uh, sort of which five kids you leave off. Um, so I think, you know, if they went from 35 to 30, uh, I think that historically there's been a movement uh, in admissions offices to keep the number of recruited athletes down to make room for other uh, types of students, different talents, and that that's been sold to the athletics departments as, okay, we're only going to take two athletes in fencing, but we're going to take the two you want. Um, and so that sort of has been the trade-off and so I don't I think that is not going to help the problems we're talking about at all um, I think that the reductions in the numbers may help affect especially at the colleges where the numbers are so high affect some of the cultural problems uh, that they see in terms of there being a strong sense of division between athletes and non-athletes which I at least my sense as an undergraduate and from talking to people is much less of a problem at bigger universities uh, like the Ivies, although it's there to some extent. Um, so I think it could be helpful, but I don't think it necessarily addresses the problem head on if the problem is sort of how much weight you're giving to coaches, just taking fewer people, it's a little roundabout. I, I don't disagree with that, but I would say at the colleges there's another issue which is less visible at a place like Harvard. Colby will admit we'll try to yield a class next year of about 485. Um, we have 32 varsity sports and so um, ensuring competitive success or at least competitiveness in those programs puts a tremendous burden, burden, puts a tremendous obligation or responsibility onto the admission office in terms of numbers and so there's a numerical aspect of this or a quantitative aspect with respect to um, how many identifiably virtuous athletes there are in that whole class and how large a part of that uh, it occupies that's a real issue in creating a class because you've got 485 <laughs> slots you've got 32 varsity teams you've got 40 percent of that 40 percent of our students will compete on an intercollegiate varsity sport team at some point in their career 40 percent of each class so you can do the math it's it's a it's 
I, oh, it's 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 a challenge. I don't know. Problem doesn't quite get at it's it's a. But the more competitiveness, the more expectation that gets summoned for those programs, the more pressure there is on the admission office to perform, to produce athletic competitiveness and success. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, um, speaking very locally about Harvard in particular, I wanted to ask Sarah what your impression was of, um, of how the data that you're talking about in, in the book relates specifically, how uh, relative to all of that do Harvard student athletes in particular um, rate, you know, as, as far as, you know, the, the preference in admissions and the scores, et cetera? We actually can't speak about individual schools as part of the confidentiality agreement when we got the data. Um, but I guess what I would say is that there weren't systematic differences between schools. Um, the data were quite consistent. On any given measure, there's going to be some variation. One school is going to be higher, one school is going to be lower than the average. But really one of the things that was sort of universal is whenever we gave the presidents, and we did give to the presidents sort of their school in comparison to their conference average, almost all of them were very surprised to see that there was very little difference between their school. You know, everyone thinks, oh, it can't be happening here. Uh, and I think one of the NESCAC presidents, and I can't even remember who it was, had the best line about this, which was, we presented to the NESCAC schools literally a bar for each school, but just no labels on them. So you could see what the variation was on various measures. And we were presenting this to a meeting of the NESCAC presidents, and one of them said, I see. There's no outliers, only liars. <laughs> true. It's a true comment. All right, on, on that note, it wasn't me. <laughs> you have heard the truth. Uh, no lies, no liars, and we are enormously grateful to both Sarah and Bro for joining us. If you'd like to buy a copy of the book, you can do so right outside the door and have it autographed, nonetheless, by Sarah Levin. Join me in thanking them. Thank you. <laughs>